of uh, the conference Violence by Design and Engineering 2020. So it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, the first speaker of the day. Uh, Dr. Karthik is there? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the first speaker is uh, Dr. Karthik Chandrasekhar. In fact, uh, Dr. Karthik Chandrasekhar received his PhD in inorganic materials chemistry from University of Vienna, Austria. Yes. Having taught in various universities around the globe, he is currently an assistant professor at uh, Neuswin University, Thailand. He has worked on several projects and publications and has keen interest in distinct topics like uh, material characterization, X-ray diffraction, SEM analysis, and these are things to name a few. Dr. Karthik will be sharing his views on bio-inspired carbide surfaces for biomedical applications. Over to Dr. Karthik. Thank you, Professor Jayaraman for the nice introduction. And uh, good evening, all of you. And I hope all of you are safe and sound, especially in, uh, during these tough times of COVID. And uh, in, in, during these times, obviously, this platform is one of the best ways to get uh, keep in touch and get introduced and also introduce our work to all the interested uh, scientists and students and uh, uh, other firms who are, um, I mean, very much interested to get connected as well. So my topic. Uh, for the evening, uh, as Professor Jayaraman pointed out, is bio-inspired metallic surfaces or carbide surfaces for uh, biomedical applications. So <clears throat> uh, before I go on with the talk, I would uh, wish to mention a few things that I thought were uh, necessary to have a, a disturbance-free presentation. So. Um, um, I have had a couple of uh, few difficulties in these kind of presentations in the last couple of months. So basically I have tried to, it is a PowerPoint presentation, but I basically tried to cut down as much animation or practically there is no animations involved. And I have cut down on uh, most of the figure speakers and also uh, try to reduce the results to few important tables, uh, actually two or three. Uh, tables, which would uh, precisely summarize what I would wish to put forth to the audience. So, and uh, further, um, I would try to uh, concentrate a little bit more, or spend a little bit more time on uh, the introductory part, the background, and a little bit about why I choose uh, the current set of materials as my target materials. Um, and then, uh, a little bit about the experimental procedure. And uh, I wouldn't concentrate much on the experimental procedure and I'll uh, try to head to the results. Um, and all I try to do, uh, wish to do is try and present a, a simple yet complete story as much as possible, keeping in mind uh, that most of the participants would be at the student level. So I'm uh, sincere apologies to all the uh, senior uh, professors, faculty, scientists, and for, for whom some of them or most of them might sound a little bit basic. So I get on with the uh, work. So in nature, <clears throat> we have, uh, nature is one of the best uh, bio designer as we could uh, call it because it's almost uh, flawless, spotless, and uh, with the maximum efficiency possible. And it, it has generated its so um, it has presented to us and we see it every day around us, but we may not realize much, but a quite and a wide ranging variety of material species and, uh, and the other stuff. They are so interesting and they work in, in such a very good balance and uh, without disturbing the others. So uh, one of the many things that nature has given that we can easily see around is uh, metals among others. So metals find uh, widespread applications in quite a few uh, uh, industrial sectors from aviation to automobiles, to defense, to uh, computer technologies, to even agriculture and uh, put it as bio applications, but it spans a 
wide spectrum of applications like from bio from in medicine to the instrumentation to the detection to the sensors and so on so practically uh, this being a session or the conference on bio inspired design and engineering the topic of our interest uh, is biocompatible materials or rather biomaterials which is one of the key disciplines and of a great interest in the uh, last few decades and substantial um, uh, in uh, work has been done and it is still in progress with newer technologies and state of the art uh, methodologies being invented or discovered uh, day in and day out uh, of course which uh, needs further refinement too so bio materials i have specifically put it as bio compatible materials because bio materials if you want to use for any as we understand in our normal uh, simple language as a layman would be like um, any materials that we use in any form uh, for uh, for the usage or inside or outside especially with respect to human beings as in plants too or all the surgical materials that we can think of and there are quite a other allied accessories too which are being which you can see um, in a hospital or in a similar institution so when we choose or when we prepare all the, all these things the materials uh, the choice of materials is very important how do we know that a particular material is good enough for this particular application so basically it boils down to the fact that the material that we choose and the, the the way we engineer and the way we design it for application has to be compatible enough with the body because after introducing it or using it it should not give newer complications and rather complicate the situation more to a irreversible level so biocompatibility is one of the very key components or uh, properties that a material has to be tested for so what by saying by biocompatibility what do we mean by that there are many sub components and i have listed a few of them this is per se not the uh, exhaustive list it depends on what kind of application we are trying to look at and what kind of materials we are trying to be look at and especially if it is inside the human body for example or in similar living organisms it also depends on the immediate local environment in which the material or the component or the uh, thing that we prepare from the starting material is being intended to be applied so some of them one of the uh, simplest one that we try to look at or we can understand is important is being excellent uh, antimicrobial efficacy so what do we mean by that <clears throat> we have billions and trillions of microbes within our body in practically every part so there are some good ones there are some bad ones in the sense like it is good for the body and it he helps and assists in certain things and there are some which are bad for the body too so in case assuming suppose uh, let's think of a implant material or like a, something like a stent or a, a, a metallic metallic component that we try to replace into our body so it should have good antimicrobial efficacy in the sense antimicrobial is against the bad microbe so it could be bacteria or the viruses some fungus fungi and similar ones but the bad ones it should be able to uh, kill them or at least in in the uh, in the least way it should be able to resist its further development as much as possible but on the other hand it should not spoil all the good cells which is around Uh, and all the uh, good microbes that it is surrounded with or or all the good cells the body cells that it is being surrounded with so antimicrobial efficacy then cytotoxicity is basically about uh, being toxic to the uh, cell or, or the particular uh, this one and against biofilm formations so the, suppose the component has to be uh, it should not be uh, Uh, favorable for the bad microbes as i said so that after a few time uh, after uh, after a while uh, the component when it is inside the body it is implanted inside the body for a specific application and suppose it is a permanent 
implant or a temporary implant, even if it is the, uh, for a few months or a few weeks, the biofilm formation, that there's a kind of formation around the uh, a component. Initially, the body or, or, or the uh, environment thinks that it is an alien one, but with, with the passage of time, it starts to think, okay, it probably it is part of our body and then it starts to be too friendly or it finds it too comfortable and it starts to grow around it. In some cases, it might be helpful, but in many cases, it may not be helpful. So um, it, is, uh, it is application specific that this, part of, uh, this property is needed. That is, in, in most cases, it should not enhance or uh, uh, support biofilm formations. Then uh, the other property that we can try to look at is biocorrosion uh, resistance. So um, uh, again, it is also uh, uh, domain specific or uh, the location specific, but generally in some parts of the body, the uh, bio environment around the element uh, or the component or the, for example, like a, if you use a titanium implant in the body somewhere. So it has this environment and it has, it undergoes some kind of corrosion for various reasons. I'm not going into the details, but the thing is if it corrodes, the component, then after a while, with the passage of time, we might lose some surface uh, material and it might mix with the system or even with the blood, depending on where it is uh, being used. So this obviously may not be very, very suitable for our application. The other one is almost uh, close in heels with the previous one which is poor ion release. So what do I mean by that? So if you have a metallic or intermetallic or a component surface which, uh, of which we have made a component and it's inside the body. So it should not keep releasing, the surface shouldn't release that metal or the ions from the surface into the body. So it's basically same as, it's partly corrosion, but it is also need not be completely corrosion, but just that the environment around the component might uh, help in an easy release of ion or components from the metallic surface into the body, which in most cases may not be very, very suitable. And there are a few more other uh, applications, uh, other properties that we might need to uh, look into, but they are all based on target, uh, the targeted application. So these things, most of them, I'm trying to put a list as many as possible here, but all of them need not be true for a component because suppose you are using a, a antimicrobial surface and it is not inside the body, but outside the body for part of some of the components. So um, some or few or a couple of them may not be needed for those things. So there are many different types of materials which have been uh, looked at tested, uh, designed, thought of, and some of them have been successfully designed and are being uh, applied to uh, with great success in uh, modern days. So uh, we, depending on the application, again, as I said, whether it is inside the body or outside the body, there are quite a few different uh, types of uh, materials that come into picture or that we can see around. So it's metal sheets, rods, some nanoparticles, then some metal oxides, like for example, titanium oxide, uh, some alloys, intermetallic alloys like titanium, aluminum, vanadium alloy, cobalt, chromium, molybdenum alloys, and uh, iron, aluminum, manganese alloys, some polymers, and also a few more are available. So one of the uh, uh, newer class of materials uh, that have gained substantial interest, especially in the last few years, is what we would call as uh, maxines or maxines. And uh, of course, there are many papers which are available in the last uh, one and a half or two decades, but especially in the last four or five years, at least from what I have gone through, there have been a substantial interest in this kind of materials. So, MXNs are generally referring to metal carbides with a particular binder and, and at one end, depending on the application, and some amount of metal nitrides. And people have are uh, now trying to look at possibly some borides too and sil sil metal silicides too in the recent years. So the current uh, topic of interest and the sample of my interest is transition metal carbides. Now, why transition metal carbides? 
let's look at some of the interesting properties of these carbides that uh, they already have uh, from the very beginning. Uh, so it's like high melting points, some excellent thermal uh, stabilities, optimal to good thermal conductivities depending on the intended applications, excellent hardness, uh, also at relatively high temperatures, high Young's modulus, high vas resistance, vas resistance, good thermal shock resistance. These are some of the mechanical properties. Suppose you are trying, trying to look at some titanium alloy or similar alloy, which you need to uh, uh, use as an implant material for uh, to replace a bone, for example, in your hand or leg, then it needs to have similar uh, mechanical and uh, mecha related properties. So, and apart from that, uh, one of the very special properties of my interest with respect to these uh, transition metal carbides are their practically very low chemical reactivity in most of the normal conditions. When I sp say specifically say normal conditions, it's primarily uh, my broader intention is to, uh, if I succeed in uh, choosing one of the materials uh, or uh, uh, discovering one of the materials with good properties, then it could be in some form or the other be applied as pure one or as a part of uh, implant material into the body. So in, the, in that sense, uh, all these pro properties are very useful. So when you have very low chemical reactivity, especially in normal conditions or body conditions, which is normally around 37 degrees, and it, it also displays excellent corrosion. So we can also uh, imagine that it uh, or expect that it could it would have very good bio corrosion too. Because if you think about bio corrosion within the body, that also corrosion is a uh, uh, also a temperature dependent process. So if you have a high temperature, the corrosion processes generally gets accelerated. But for body conditions, for example, 37 degrees at normal conditions, biocorrosion with this kind of properties, we can expect that these materials would surely hold against any possible corrosion too. And thus, I thought this could be possible candidate materials for biocompatible applications. So, the materials, I'm now getting into the materials and methods process. So uh, the samples that I chose were uh, practically as received transition metal carbides that I could at that point of time uh, get directly from the market at uh, cheaper prices and also uh, at the earliest. So it's, it's more of uh, the seven things that I uh, thought of using was mostly due to a logistical reasons because the other, I wanted to also try niobium carbide and other possible uh, nickel carbide and so on, but I couldn't get at the time. So I'm restricting myself to these seven carbides. They were all of analytical grade and they had an average mesh size of about 200 to 400, except for one or two, which had a mesh size of about two microns. So the bacteria that I chose to investigate against uh, are, Oh, before that, I let me let you know. Uh, for the antimicrobial property, when we say antimicrobial efficacy or property, microbe is anything uh, like bacteria or virus or protozoa or fungus or similar thing. So, in principle, to think about a possible very good antimicrobial and biocompatible antimicrobial material, you would in principle need to look at antibacterial, antiprotozoal, antiviral, antifungal, and so on, and uh, test against different uh, microbes within each uh, microbial group, and then come to a conclusion. Because in many cases, depending, people uh, test only one particular variety, for example, only antibacterial property, or only antiprotozoal, or antiviral, or antifungal, and then, uh, even within them, they try to choose uh, depending on the application and depending on the uh, logistics available, either with one microbe or with many microbes as much as possible. So here I have decided to, uh, with the available things, I, I could do antimicrobial, uh, antibacterial and antiprotozoal 
uh, efficacies. So the bacteria that I chose was E. coli, Escherichia coli, which is one of the most common and uh, in some, sometimes okay, but sometimes very pathogenic and gram negative, representative gram negative bacteria. The strain that I used has this particular code name, ATCC25922. And the other uh, microbe that I chose for my investigation was a representative gram positive bacteria, which is Staphylococcus aureus. And it has a uh, code name ATCC6538P. I was told uh, that this P uh, specifically refers to that particular strain of the species, which is relatively more penicillin resistant. So if we can have a material that can actually kill this, uh, this strain of that, then it is even better. And for the anti uh, protozoal properties, I chose Acanthabim, Acanthamoeba. It is one of the very common uh, single walled and uh, protozoa, which is uh, which can be found in almost uh, most of the uh, most different kinds of habitats. And it is right from any metallic surface to a polymer surface to soil to water, and even it can be found uh, in to contact lenses and in and the contact lens solutions if you don't take proper precautions. So. I, I tried to work with eight different strains of Akanth amoeba that, that I could uh, uh, hold on to. And of that non-pathogenic type were NEFF and PV30 by 40, as they call it. And the other were clinically isolable or basically pathogenic type, which is 11DS72BAR2Z0092HH1BU and 312BAR12. Now, before I go on, I must, I wish to add one more uh, uh, think about my background is I'm basically a chemist and materials chemist working mostly with solid state uh, chemistry and basically alloy development. So this is a new application that I've tried, uh, tried and I I'm not a typical microbiologist. So I'm trying to put as much information as possible uh, within my general understanding. So for the antibacterial efficacies, the method used, there are many methods available, uh, conventionally available methods. Um, um, most of them have an incubation time or of about 24 hours, and I, um, you can call it like disk diffusion or lunar agar diffusion or four plate method or split, spread plate method, as they call it. I'm not allowed to do that because I don't have the biosafety level certificate. So I have, I, I gave all the samples to a testing center. Uh, it's a national facility in Thailand, uh, which is called MTech. Uh, center belonging to the National uh, Science and Technology Agency. So they do all the tests. So I'm, uh, these are, my, and I'm listing the um, conditions as they gave it to me. So the, sorry, the method which they adopted was ASTM E2149 13A method, which is one of the methods described for testing the antibacterial properties of materials. And there are different kinds of materials and different kinds of surfaces. So there are many different uh, modified versions of antibacterial testing and they have been uh, listed in particular code names. So ASTM is American Society for Testing and Materials. And they have this particular method for this kind of samples. So what is the speciality of my sample? For, in general, antibacterial testing, all the samples are generally dissolved in a suitable solvent. But here, because their chemical reactivity is pretty low and we don't use very high aggressive solvents, they are practically insoluble. So they, even if you prepare a solution with the powders, they eventually with period of time, the passage of time, they become, uh, it's actually a suspension. And after some time, they try to uh, go down and settle down at the bottom. We don't want that precipitation to happen. So this is a dynamic contact condition uh, method in which what uh, they try to do is they have a conical flask and they have the bacteria, uh, bacteria culture, which they have already prepared uh, one or two or three days in uh, three days before, and it is ready for the testing. They add that into the flask, and then they also add the, our particular sample into it. And they uh, fix it to a, a instrument where it is being uh, agitated at 110 uh, rotations per minute at room temperature. So, but before that, the, the uh, incubation that takes place is for roughly probably about a day uh, at uh, room temperature. So it's about 35 plus or minus two. 
and after that when the dynamic condition agitation condition is being set up and it, the experiment and the machine has started to agitate vigorously it is being exposed uh, for a period of 1 hour so this 1 hour time duration of exposure is the uh, standard recommend time as per this particular method but for my personal interest i have also tried to look at the uh, response of the materials after 24 hours too which means after the initiation of the agitation condition so they wait for 1 hour and then they take some amount of sample out and look at the response and then they leave it and then they continue they again continue it uh, put it uh, the rest they leave it and they allow it to agit get agitated for another one day and after 24 hours they once again take samples and try to analyze so what we are trying to do in both this antibacterial and anti protozoal uh, efficacy testing is basically very simple you have our sample you have the microbe we try to uh, get both of them into contact especially the microbe has to be in contact with the uh, target material which is our sample material and allow it to uh, interact and see if our target material of interest can actually kill the microbe or not so this is the uh, in a nutshell this is what we are trying to do in all the procedure so what should be the the corollary of that is at the end of the experiment in antibacterial uh, efficacy testing the amount of dead bacteria that is available is identified and then its corresponding percentage reduction as they call it the percentage reduction in the bacteria which means how much bacteria has died because of the interaction that is being deduced so the method relevant calculations for that is like you have an initial concentration of bacteria and sample especially the bacteria which they refer to as colony forming units per ml so that is the unit that they use to represent it so they take that they uh, they record the initial concentration of the bacteria then they put it with the sam we put it with the sample and we agitate and at the end of the exposure intended exposure time we try to look at how much bacteria has died so b is actually the amount which is present in the control which means in the beginning and a is the amount along with the sample at the end so by using this uh, percentage reduction of bacteria formula b minus a by b into 100 we calculate the percentage reduction and that will that is in most cases a direct almost a direct indication of the effectiveness of our sample the other methods for uh, I'm, I'm not uh, going because of time constraints let i'm not going to talk in detail about the anti protozoal uh, efficacy testing method but more or less they correspond to the conventional uh, more conventional not this above method this e 214a method this is a dynamic condition but those were tested according to the other conventional methods available for antibacterial testing as i said uh, they are disk diffusion agar diffusion or spread plate or pore plate technique i think many of you might be aware of that but it is not exactly again as i said depending on the microbe and our sample it is not the exact method that is being used but we did quite a bit of uh, the the uh, partner group did a quite a bit of testing with respect to the concentration and also the method and have they have tried to tweak the method a little bit to suit our kind of samples it's actually a long procedure so i i but in in nutshell before testing amoeba two things uh, the one thing that we need to know is amoeba uh, this acanth amoeba uh, exist in two uh, forms one is the tropocyte form and the cyst form the tropocyte form is normally the most uh, active form and it, it it causes all the infections that we can look around but it is also vulnerable to very harsh conditions but on the other hand what it does is when he encounters uh, when it encounters a very harsh condition it forms a cyst and then it stays there and it can stay up to even i'm told about until uh, 8 months to even 1 year depending on the condition so when the favorable conditions come back they again uh, come out of the cyst form and they transform into the tropocyte and then they affect so we need to test uh, the our my partner group 
uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Bilavan Pumidonmek from the microbiology department uh, in Narisawan University. They did this uh, testing activity. They, the whole procedure in a nutshell boils down to preparation of the tropocytes. Then from tropocytes, you need to prepare the cysts. Then when these two are prepared, then they too have to be separately tested against the exposure with uh, my samples. And then at the end, we just see if the tropocyte is dead or the cyst is dead. So the best would be to look at if the cyst can be dead. So the experiments were repeated some two, three times with varying amount of concentrations and the results I will talk about at the moment. So now to the results. Um, this is in a nutshell about the antibacterial efficacies of all the uh, seven samples against Escherichia coli for a, a one hour exposure time and a 24 hour exposure time. So I'm, I did not list a lot of, actually there are a lot more data and tables of data available before we come at this conclusion, but this is more or less very straightforward and simple to understand. And considering the time constraint, I think this is the best to look at and uh, arrive at the conclusion. So the first table on the left is the antibacterial efficacy of the samples after an exposure time of one hour. And this is actually as per the recommended e 21493 a method, that is the ASTM method that I discussed. So of the seven samples, we can clearly see, I would like to draw your attention to this uh, numbers, which are highlighted in blue, which is actually the percentage reduction of bacteria that has been calculated. And the other one on the right is the log 10 value of the same. So this might to some extent be a little bit confusing if you are a first time at a look at, but the one in the middle, the one highlighted in blue, I would like to draw your attention to that. So from the list, we can clearly see what the numbers say is suppose titanium carbide, it says 14, which means 14%. That means uh, only 14% reduction in the amount of bacteria. But if you look at the third specimen, molybdenum carbide, it shows almost greater than 99% reduction, which means almost 100% reduction, even uh, especially within the just one hour exposure time that is being used. So molybdenum carbide clearly is very, 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 very effective from this research. And I was told by the testing center that they tried to repeat it two to three times and they more or less came up with the uh, same data, which is almost like reproducible. So the other one that we can look at is tungsten carbide, the specimen number five, it also sh shows about 86% reduction. So it is also reasonably good uh, it also uh, demonstrates. Excuse me, Professor Karthikian, your time is your time is going to end. Yeah, I please. have just two slides. Okay. Please, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so tungsten carbide is uh, pretty close to molybdenum carbide. Although, if you look at the log values, it indicates that molybdenum carbide is really substantially uh, very effective compared to tungsten. There are other two, which shows a very low to medium one with silicon carbide showing practically nil efficiency. On the right side, if you can look at it, it is at after 24 hour ex, uh, exposure, obviously with more amount of time available, uh, it increases the interaction time. We can see practically almost, most of the samples show a very enhanced activity. The ones that had like titanium carbide just having 14% after one hour, it shows nearly 82% re reduction after 24 hours. But molybdenum carbide, vanadium carbide, and also tungsten carbide show nearly 99% reduction or more than that. So they also become equally effective. Similarly, if you look at the same data, same set of experiments and same set of data for against Staphylococcus aureus, which is a gram positive one. Again, by default, molybdenum carbide shows the most uh, effective response for this with vanadium carbide a little bit and tungsten carbide too uh, showing effective responses again but after a 24 hour exposure time which obviously 
uh, is understandable. The same three show almost equal and very high activity in uh, against the bacteria. The others practically don't show any activity. So effectively, molybdenum carbide for both the bacteria, even within the first one hour exposure, it clearly shows that it is the most effective one with vanadium and tungsten showing reasonably good, but not as effective as molybdenum carbide. And the other ones practically showing nothing. The surprising thing is tar titanium carbide, obviously, which most of the people would expect, including me, did not show that much activity. So the last one, the last slide of the result is, this is the summary of the anti-amibicidal efficacies, which means the anti-protozoal efficacy against the acanthan B strain. And at the left, you see the top. The top ones are all the six pathogenic ones, and the last two are the uh, non-pathogenic ones. And for the seven samples, and these are the uh, concentrations in milligram per milliliter. So I would like to, this is in symbols, which is like plus and zero. So I would like to draw your attention to only one thing. So what do they mean? If it is zero, then it means it has nearly killed all the protozoa. If it is just one plus, then it is practically kind of being neutral or it does not support much. If it, and the two plus symbol shows that it has, it kind of doesn't inhibit, but there's a slight enhanced activity. And the three plus practically shows that the bacteria, the mic, uh, the uh, acanthamoeba strain is completely not at all hindered by the uh, by the target material. So with the simple explanation, what we need to specifically look at to understand which is most effective is to try to look for the zeros which I have highlighted, zeros and minimum one plus, just one plus. So it is, you can clearly see it's only titanium carbide which has the maximum number of zeros for the different one and couple of one plus ones and two pluses and only one three plus in whole stuff. So effectively in this uh, amoebicidal efficacy test, it's only titanium carbide which seems to perform very well compared to the other one and tantalum carbide two some extent and all the others practically being ineffective. So conclusions from the antibacterial uh, efficacies and the antiprotozoal efficacies, we can clearly conclude that molybdenum carbide is the most effective antibacterial agent, uh, at least from this test, with vanadium and tungsten showing relatively uh, good amounts. And in uh, for the anti-protozoal, it's titanium carbide and none of them being effective. And in principle, few more tests are also needed to conclude if it is antimicrobial, because we have looked at only two kinds of microbes. <clears throat> there are a couple of other more, which we need to look at to make a complete picture. So quickly, I'll just take 10 seconds uh, for the acknowledgements, which I think is very important. I'd like to uh, thank my uh, university, Faculty of Science, Narasimhan University, and especially for the university grant for this research. And uh, my testing partners were um, uh, MTech from the NSTDA facility, which is the National Science and Technology Facility for Thailand. And doctor, they, they did all the antibacterial tests. And Dr. Vilavan Pumidoming, uh, who belongs to the Department of Microbiology of, this, of my university, and uh, she is an anti-protozoan expert and, uh, be, uh, and she did all the tests, all the anti-protozoan tests in her labs. And we also wish to thank Dr. Yulia Waloshnik, who is from ISPTM Austria for supplying all the different pathological strains. And I would like to thank all my colleagues and friends in NU and also my friends there. And especially here, I would like to draw the attention and thank uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Sabrish of CBST uh, for introducing me uh, to BIDE uh, 2020. And uh, so my first uh, line of thanks goes to him. I also wish to thank Professor Prakasam, Professor Suresh, uh, Dr. Devashish Mestra, and Professor uh, Dr. Osborne, and the whole BIDE team for this wonderful opportunity to present my work. And last but not least, Dr. Nyana Shekharan, a retired scientist from IGKAR Kalpakam, and uh, Professor Ipsar my, uh, from the University of Vienna and my PhD supervisor. They are my mentors and my gratitude always goes to them for the training and uh, encouragement and, and the modulation that they gave in me to think about things. And last but not least to my family for their 
eternal support thank you once again for the wonderful opportunity thank you very much thank you professor and you. Uh, we have a couple of questions to you just uh, if you can explain maybe yes, two two of them you may pick up one of the questions from ashini kumar mm -hmm. that do metal carbides show leaching once inside the animal system that 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 uh, actually that part needs to be tested we we have i i do not have enough funding to test those part so that actually comes uh, th this whole work um, is intended as a kind of a feasibility study and also the first step towards developing it as a surface modification so my primary yeah. interest was to look at uh, these tests choose the one which looks very promising take them and possibly coat it on uh, my interest was to look at ss316l which is one of the commonly used medical grade steel try to coat it on them and then try to make uh, the implant materials or other things that are for which it is normally used so uh, that question about him whether it Excuse it comes at the latest stage yeah beyond beyond that he had another questions following that yes. if yes. there is a leaching there must be some inflammatory response yes. so you yes. must look into okay exactly. and yes. next questions next questions given by dr anusha yes, uh, that uh, he she worked on ternary um, ternary transition metal nitrides for okay. biocompatible applications okay and uh, you are mentioning the transition metal carbides right his yes. her yes. question is that have you tried ternary transition metal carbides or its binary carbides um uh, this is basically simple uh, binary carbides i would say i did not go into the ternary one so and that and it's precisely because i try to get directly from the as i mentioned in the material section it is as received samples directly because i was a new faculty and i didn't have my lab so i tried to go with as simple samples as possible so to answer her question uh, sorry not yet well professor i have a question yes please that uh, you should address the how the mechanism mechanism deals to do the antibacterial activity or anti protozoal ah. activity the mechanisms sure. must be sorted out yes sure okay okay and yeah. uh, so let there are a lot many questions which okay. could be posted to you for finding your answers okay. in due time so uh, i would be happy to answer them i'm, I'm very happy okay. to answer them yeah okay thank you very much for joining thank us you very, thank, thank you. you thank you very much for the opportunity thank you dr karthik thank you thank you very thank much thank you thank you very much we'll move on to the next speaker probably yes yes please so our uh, next speaker from uh, vit and we have uh, dr devashish mishra in fact uh, dr devashish mishra works as an associate professor in the school of biosciences and technology who is hosting this uh, conference as well and uh, he is passionate about uh, bioinspired design he initiated bioinspired design course in vit 2016 in fact uh, this is one of the online courses that uh, the first online course which vit has launched he organized many techno innovation events like uh, bioinspired design healthathon now uh, health ideathon etc so that uh, students are kept engaged in this uh, prime field uh, in fact he has uh, uh, he is uh, in charge of many student interdisciplinary societies and uh, one of the chapters at vit which is called as the society of biological engineering uh, started as sbe vit and there are uh, many things that he has uh, done he has focused on research and innovation and he has obtained his phd from iit kharagpur in the area of biomaterials injectable gels and tissue engineering in the year 2014 In fact, his uh, research uh, research interest lies in finding tangible, affordable, and sustainable solutions to concurrent biomedical problems via biomedics and bio-inspired approach. 
In fact, he has uh, several articles and several talks that he has given in this uh, field. Today, he will be sharing his uh, thoughts on biometric answer to a medical implant associated antimicrobial resistance. So may I invite Dr. Devashish to make the presentation, please. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, so uh, my topic would be uh, uh, biomimetic, finding biomimetic answers to biomedical implant associated antimicrobial resistance. It's not only biomedical implant associated uh, uh, resistance we are talking about. We need to see that antimicrobial resistance is uh, as, as a very grave issue, uh, which can uh, you know, send us to the iron age where we didn't have any antibiotics and uh, any small infection could have killed uh, uh, multiple people. Now I'll go through the uh, presentation. Um, I'll first explain the uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, uh, overall context. And, uh, and then we'll uh, try to see how, what are the answers available in the world and what is our approach. Now, um, if I... Um, uh, so uh, the best thing, uh, clinically, people see that how antimicrobial resistance uh, is there. Antimicrobial as in uh, an antibiotic is called an antimicrobial. And uh, people, uh, yeah, clinicians actually take samples from your body and uh, they, they put it into a uh, culture. So if the samples contain bacteria, they will grow into a, into a bacteri bacterial plate culture. And over there, they will put a lot of this antibiotic. These are called antibiotic disks. You can see that, antibiotic disks. So uh, you see that if each disk contain different varieties of antibiotics and uh, and you will see a blank or clear zone there. That means in that zone, bacteria are not there. That means this antibiotic is effective. Now, what are the condition where antibiotic resistance happen or antimicrobial resistance happen? You see the similar number of antibiotics have been put, similar types of antibiotic has been put, and you see there are no zone of inhibitions here. That means uh, the bacteria can grow comfortably with these antibi antibiotics. Now, uh, now, suppose you are uh, having an infection and doctor wrongly uh, you know, prescribes this antibiotic, then uh, there is high chances that we may not recover very easily. Um, and this thing also happens in ICU. Like uh, we always say that in, in uh, you know, most grave condition, we are taken to the uh, ICU. But uh, uh, you know, in ICU, we may catch this infection very much. So um, let's uh, see what are the uh, social context here. Now, people are really uh, afraid and, you know, India uh, takes step pretty, uh, you know, after some, um, after the Western countries start taking steps on this. And you see, this is a, uh, a newspaper front page. It's an ICMR uh, Pfizer Institute to before uh, the COVID uh, situation came, we were really very much concerned. The whole world is really very much concerned that uh, gradually all antibiotics will lose effect. Now, what is the reason uh, all antibiotics will lose effect? Let's see. Um, uh, these are certain anecdotes we see. Uh, this is the content. I'll just um, go through very fast. I have to delete a lot of slides because of the Anecdotes as in, you see, uh, in US also, it's not only in India, in US also, you see, uh, there had been uh, the antibiotic uh, In 2015 itself, they have found uh, one of the most potent, potent uh, antibiotic that is cholesterol. They found 15 cases of cholesterol resistance. And uh, in 2016, um, they have also found uh, but uh, you see, there is a prediction that at uh, uh, by 2050, we people will be dying more out of antimicrobial resistance than that of the cancer. This is this is much more higher than that of the. Now people are dying can, uh, more out of diabetes. So uh, that means um, that means it is really a grave situation. Uh, in the COVID situation also where people are really uh, 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 bothered about, uh, you know, going to hospital, many people are 
uh, succumbing to the COVID infections because see COVID is uh, some uh, somehow uh, damaging the upper layer of the, of the lungs, uh, the inside layer of the lungs, and that actually is facilitating this um, bacteria to infect your lungs very much. And if the bacteria is antimicrobial resistant, we don't have um, uh, treatment against uh, COVID, but we do have treatment against bacteria. So if, uh, if uh, the bacteria turns out to be an antimicrobial resistant, then uh, it is a very lean chance people will get survived out of it. So now what are the most susceptible, uh, uh, most suspected bacteria? Uh, as uh, Dr. Karthikeyan said, uh, sorry, Karthik Chandrasekharan said, uh, one of the mo uh, most suspected uh, bacteria is E. coli. But in 1980, uh, there had been a report, so, uh, most cited report that they say that the antimicrobial resistance, uh, majorly con major contributors are Y bacteria. In short, they are called escape. These are the two names you see, the uh, first names of them, escape. Uh, among that, you see, this one is very common in India, uh, and Enterobacter is very common in India. Klebsiella uh, pneumonia is very common in India. So uh, that means if the, there are uh, the presence of even one bacteria, uh, there is a possibility that uh, antimicrobial resistance can develop. Now, um, and if there are presence of multiple bacteria, they can really have a party there. And uh, let's see how antimicrobial resistance develop. This is a short definition of uh, antimicrobial resistance. You see, um, CDC defines it, uh, you know, that uh, it is very difficult to treat people with infection with uh, antimicrobial resistance. And it is many uh, highly costly and sometimes you need to take toxic alternatives. That means you are uh, people, uh, the doctor may put you in more risk of losing your life to save your life though. According to CDC, this is how it works, uh, the antimicrobial resistance. Um, this is a very vivid uh, picture. You see, um, there, are, uh, there is a population of bacteria. This, uh, you know, rod ship things are bacteria, of course. And, uh, um, you know, you put antibiotic, only this purple thing um, survive because they have already turned uh, resistant. But initially they are very less in population. Now, um, once the susceptible antibiotic susceptible bacteria die, it gives fair chances for the resistant bacteria to grow more and more. Now, um, I think uh, a, a bell rings here, like uh, we are seeing uh, uh, the theory of uh, Darwin, that is uh, survival of the fetus. Um, so you see, that means uh, among a population who have developed this, uh, this mutation, can uh, actually uh, develop antibacterial resistance. Now, what are the facility? Uh, what are the additional thing which can facilitate this happening? Uh, if you have uh, taken less less amount of antibiotic, then it is facilitated. If you do not take antibiotic, uh, you know, properly, uh, what do you say, in a haphazard fashion, not in a due course of time, that can happen. If doctors put excess amount of antibiotic, then also it can happen. And especially this happens during trauma. Trauma meaning anybody having road accident, doctors don't want to take chance. They put, push a loads of anti, uh, antibiotic. And surprisingly, there was a study in US, trauma related uh, surgeries, which also involves implantation of rods for fixing the bones and all. So um, metallic rods for fixing the bones. These uh, surgeries often, 50% uh, of these surgeries lead to antimicrobial resistance. These are not terminal antimicrobial resistance, meaning not any antibiotic doesn't work on them, not like that, but um, maximum antibiotic doesn't work on them. If no antibiotic works, we call these bugs as superbugs, these bacteria superbugs. One citation we had from India, um, uh, sorry, um, there is a bacteria called New Delhi uh, bacteria. It has got a special protein called New Delhi protein which causes antibiotic resistance. That means that has evolved because of this, uh, you know, uh, uh, reckless use of antibiotics. Now that means if there is antibiotics, it is a small molecule, bacteria is small and uh, bacteria can grow very fast. And uh, if you 
think about Darwinian uh, evolution. So if there is any evolutionary uh, environmental challenge, uh, the, the living systems try to tackle it through certain variations. Yeah, so, um, so bacteria are very fast growing uh, organisms. They can, that's the reason they can um, do fast mutations also, meaning change in their genetic uh, structure. And uh, viruses are far more smarter. They can uh, do the mutations far, far more smarter than uh, fast than that of bacteria. That's why no uh, medicines are there as of yet for multiple viruses. But now let, let's see this challenge is a molecule. Now, um, do they have uh, uh, things to process the molecules? Yeah, they do have enzymes to process molecules. And uh, they find the enzyme and they, uh, they just uh, uh, make it, you know, tweak it a uh, little bit and to find, uh, finally make it effective against um, antibiotics. The first uh, instance of antibiotic resistance was way back cited in uh, 1960s somewhere. Uh, where uh, they found penicillin resistant bacteria having a special enzyme called penicillase. Now, is it so different? No, because see, my, uh, molecules are being produced in living systems uh, and, and uh, you know, fungus normally produces these, uh, uh, these molecules and bacteria can uh, anyway oversmart to uh, address a molecule. Uh, it's a slight genetic change, can change, us, uh, change the protein uh, to a bit and uh, the enzymes now becomes effective towards uh, an, uh, a bacteria, uh, uh, an antibiotic. Now, <clears throat> that means the problem is a small molecule antibiotic. Now, if I can really pin it, uh, pinpoint it out. Now, um, there have been some uh, ways to manage it uh, regularly. They normally see that here, uh, it is very prominent that they wanted new diagnostic kits for antimicrobial resistance, new varieties of drugs. New varieties of drug can be a non-antibiotic drug. Now, this is a, 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 a century where we are very much into finding non-antibiotic drug. Non-antibiotic drug may not be exactly, uh, you know, uh, derived to kill bacteria, but they are they are able to kill. Now, uh, let's see what are the non-antibiotic systems. Um, fluorouracil is a, 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 a anti-cancer drug. Okay. And now they are being used for preventing biofilm, uh, biofilm formation in catheter. If you see, this is a uh, patient and this is a catheter which goes inside its uh, vein. There is high chances that biofilm formation happens or meaning a lot of microbes, uh, you know, uh, paste themselves uh, tightly into the, uh, into the wall of the uh, catheter and they keep on uh, resisting the drug now. So if, they, if you prevent uh, biofilm formation, then there is high chances that these bacteria can become drug susceptible, meaning antibiotic susceptible again. So they have pinpointed to biofilm formation. There is one more uh, 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 drug which is not approved in India. Uh, in India, we have a company called Gangajan. I happened to meet uh, there. Um, but in USA, it is, uh, in some states of USA, it is legal now. Phase meaning it's a virus, like bacteria eats up on us, uh, some of the organ infects us, a virus can infect a bacteria because viruses are very small. Now this is the wall of a bacteria you see, and these are the viruses. They can, uh, uh, they can eat up the bacteria. Now if we have this virus uh, in, in our body, then potentially these bacteria can be killed. Now can bacteria become smarter than the virus? Uh, possibly not because virus is muted with far, far more uh, faster than that of the bacteria. So if bacteria uh, goes one step, virus can go 100 steps. But why it is not so popular? There is certain uh, limitations here. Our immune system, you know, they are very much, they get very much alert when there is a protein component, uh, especially protein component which enters your body. Phases are normally, uh, you find it in the sludge and uh, 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 environments uh, in, in, in dirty environments and you, so these uh, these proteins aren't the proteins present on the phase body or phase surfaces aren't familiar to that of your human blood so what happens is blood tries to think uh, thinks that this is a foreign body and they immediately uh, react to that and uh, that can if uh, the phase dose is very high people can die out of your body's own reaction so um, it's a very pertinent uh, um, problem. 
Now, only one thing we can do is we can have immunosuppressant and have this phase therapy, but that will put your body into additional kind of risks. What are the other uh, alternatives? Other alternatives are new potential drugs. These aren't are there in the market, not yet tested in hip and things, but <clears throat> they have very high potentials. They were in research, uh, uh, research stage. Uh, the first uh, drug, which has recently become very famous in 2016, uh, was uh, an, uh, a, a, it's not a drug exactly. It's a polymer uh, and, and peptide complex. Um, it's a bigger thing, like it's a dendrimer plus um, peptide, uh, uh, peptide complex. It looks like a star. Its uh, size is very much comparable to that of bacteria, as good as a phase. I'll just show you. Um, so it can work uh, against, uh, you know, multidrug resistant bacteria. Now, uh, how does it Let's work? Try your time, please. Yeah, I'll just take another five minutes, sir. Um, um, so this is uh, this works uh, because it is a material and it has got a protein component. Now I'll just show you this SEM image. We call, they call it a star-shaped polymer, uh, star-shaped polymer which has got peptides attached to it. Now you see here, uh, this is a bacteria, and bacteria surface uh, is actually getting damaged if the polymers, uh, which is called uh, this. Uh, is there. So that means this is the largest structure and bacteria if that has to find a, a solution to it, it has to really work hard. It's not a single molecule, it's a complex material now. So uh, is there any other alternatives? Yes, uh, there are other alternatives that uh, which doesn't actively kill, but they will, uh, you know, majority of the polymers and biomaterials, I think uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar will agree, many of the, his metal, uh, uh, metallic materials are there, which can uh, kill the bacteria using these, these uh, mechanisms, hydrophobic repulsions. These are not specific mechanisms which will work in a particular uh, pathway of bacteria, but in general, it destabilizes the membrane and uh, all of the cell wall of the bacteria. Now, these are certain uh, list of passive biomaterials and these are certain list of active biomaterials, which can potentially kill the bacteria. But there is a catch. These uh, passives one, they are somehow, somehow biocompatible, but the active one are uh, not compatible to your body also. That means it will kill bacteria, but it can kill your human cells as well. So you may not be having uh, these kind of uh, materials in this. So there is one group who tries, to, there is arrays of varieties of uh, polymers. So this, uh, this is group, uh, this is a uh, US and there is a UK group also. They make an array of polymer and, uh, you know, um, and try to test bacteria and living cells together so that they, they find an antimicrobial as well as a biocompatible or uh, human compatible polymer on that. So they have found a couple of polymers in this manner. Now, um, what is our approach? My approach is uh, we just uh, uh, got a thought that there are a lot of invertebrates uh, and, and lower vertebrates which uh, stay in a very dirty environment uh, which are full of bacteria and still they, they normally uh, sustain their life and keep their generations on and on. They don't have a, a robust immune, uh, immune systems like us. For an example, you see this is a zebra fish. Uh, the egg of a zebra fish doesn't have any active immune system, but it has certain proteins called the zinc finger protein, which uh, this paper says that it, uh, it is maternal origin, meaning egg uh, is made up of all uh, uh, the proteins and uh, structures present in the, in the mother, and it can bind to lipopolysaccharide, uh, 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 that is an active component of the uh, gram-positive cell, uh, cell walls of bacteria. Now, it can potentially kill the bacteria as well. So, um, uh, can, uh, what is the mechanism, how it can do? Let's see how uh, uh, zinc polypeptide complex work. Uh, zinc uh, is a metal, divalent metal. It's a transition metal though. So, um, it attaches to your, uh, uh, the protein with uh, hanging with four amino acids of any kind of protein. It has, it is very popular and multifunctional uh, structure or domain of uh, proteins. It does a lot of functions like, uh, you know, trans uh, transcription factors uh, and, and RNA binding protein. It does a lot of things. 
Uh, that means this structure, once it is incorporated, it can give a lot of properties to a protein or a polypeptide chain. Now, um, you see how, how does this four member con configuration, these are the amino acids, uh, cysteine, cysteine, these are negatively charged amino acids and two positively charged amino acids. There could be this configuration, one positively charged and three negatively charged or all four negatively charged amino acids. They can hang up a, a, a zinc through coordination bonding. Now, uh, these are the structures they can, uh, uh, they can produce. You see there, here the zinc finger domains are trying to bind to a DNA. You see the zinc finger domain are not exactly leaving the zinc. It's not a substitution. Rather, uh, the zinc finger domain somehow finds a specific uh, you know, uh, shape which uh, prefers to bind to DNA. What, what is a DNA? DNA is a negatively charged molecule. And what is L lipopolysaccharide? It is also a negatively charged molecule. It's a polymer again. So um, can we take this cue and uh, say that if we can reproduce it, zinc finger protein having in a large quantity for a biomaterial application, it's very difficult. <clears throat> but can we mimic this structure in a biomaterial? That is our approach here. Uh, the structure of a gram polymer. A Staphylococcus aureus is a lipo, uh, gram positive bacteria. Now, how do we emulate? We took uh, um, uh, uh, a polypeptide analog, uh, uh, a, um, a polymer of carbohydrate, and it's a bit of negatively charged and deuterionic polymer. And we try to make a complex it uh, uh, with zinc. And uh, before we made a complex, we tried to cross link it with some. Um, um, and this is how we see the cross-linking efficiency is good here. Uh, this is our work. And I'll take another, just one minute, I'll wrap it up. Uh, so we made varieties of this polymers, uh, multiple permutation of combinations, but we, uh, we just, uh, uh, I'll just show you how does how this work. This is the uh, carboxymethyl kyphosin, and here is a genipin. Genipin cross-links this, um, uh, you know, two genipin molecules. Uh, are engaged to crosslink to. Now, if this is a structure, when zinc comes here, if if there is no genipin, uh, one uh, positive charge ion is involved. This is already people have given this theory. Uh, once uh, those who have worked on kyphosin, CMC, kyphosin, and zinc, but we have used genipin. You see that when genipin is used, the amino groups are consumed here. N groups are consumed here. Now, still the complex is there and the complex is far more stronger. And we found it through spectroscopic technique. And now we, we believe that it is four uh, uh, oxygen atom, which, is, uh, which it is making complex with. That means four negatively charged. And you can see there is always a four membered ring with a zinc complex. Now, this is the structure. This uh, polymer is now very stable. With zinc, it becomes very, very strong. I'm not going to talk about the strength and it, it actually became very strong. I'll just come down to the antimicrobial properties. The same zone of inhibition experiments we saw. The central part, you see it's a potent antibiotic and you see there is a bacteria called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a gram negative. You see there is a positive gram positive bacteria. Gram positive bacteria, S aureus, has two varieties. We have one biophil forming variety, one non-forming variety. You see, this uh, matrix is being uh, uh, works with both of the polymers, uh, both of the bacteria, biofilm or non-biofilm forming, and it makes a slight zone of inhibition. You can't say it is really killing it out uh, as good as antibiotic, but it is not allowing bacteria to grow on it. Here, you see this uh, when we, uh, you know, deliberately seed bacteria onto the uh, polymer surface, uh, the the disc we made. You see. The, in 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 the in the place where we don't have zinc, you see there is a thick biofilm formation of bacteria. This is thick mat, almost like a you know sticky grease. But where there is uh, zinc present, then you see bacteria are there. But uh, some bacteria are have a broken uh, uh, shape, and 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 they are very few in number. Now, um, normally antimicrobial polymers are toxic to human cells. And the most sensitive human cell is your RBC uh, because it has a very delicate membrane and subtle change of pH and um, you know charges around will uh, burst it off. You, we have just tried this, uh, you know, uh, tried to see how the surface works. 
and you see the RBCs are uh, seems really very healthy. These are the proteins, plasma proteins. Who have this is a pseudo colored uh, um, uh, scanning electron microscopy image of the uh, RBCs in the zinc complex uh, surfaces. Now here you see this is dental pulp stem cell, and you see dental pulp stem cells made a very thick mat on the surface. The yellow thing is dental pulp stem cells. Good thing we see here is the the mat was toned down, and you see the uh, nucleus uh, of other cells. Uh, that that means uh, the cyt uh, the cytoskeletons are very much stretched here, and uh, it it really uh, looks good. Really, it is healthy. So, what is the conclusion now uh, and future implications? Yes, um, uh, there is potential that these biomimetic biomaterials can really replace antibiotics, especially if we are talking about trauma. Locally, if there is an antimicrobial uh, uh, biomaterial, then it can really help to get us uh, rid of the uh, trauma because um, people, uh, doctor, inject more of antibiotic into your body just in an apprehension that in that location, uh, they might not have cleaned you know, properly and some bacteria they might have left during the surgery. And if you uh, allow the, the, the biomaterial itself, meaning whatever the rods or uh, you know, cement they use, biomaterial itself to deal with the local infections, then job is done. So it can uh, replace, uh, uh, visually it can replace uh, the antibiotic use or it will reduce the antibiotic use a lot. So um, it can potentially fight antimicrobial resistance, of course. And uh, polymers should only not be considered. Now, organometallic polymers uh, complexes may be considered. There are a lot of organometallic complexes which are actually pesticides and very, very toxic to it. But we just show you showed you that it is not toxic, although it is our um, and, and there is, of course, concern that if this also you know, gets uh, antimicrobial resistance. But as this thing is a very large thing and doesn't uh, target a single molecule, then uh, probably uh, it will it will work and, and antimicrobial resistance may not develop. And, um, my talk is over and I should I, uh, the participants of uh, uh, by 2020, I, I have a lot of patients within them. Still, we have 145. Thank you. Yeah. We thank uh, the chair and co-chair for allowing me to speak additional um, and uh, I should thank um, uh, VIT management uh, to, uh, to find the uh, work we have. This work was published in. Uh, I should thank my collaborators, Professor uh, Professor Nitin and Professor uh, in and So there is one more. He's retired now. Uh, Voice is not audible. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, so I, I am thankful to my collaborator and advisor, both are doctors. One is Dr. Nityanandam and Dr. Uh, Dilip Kumar Patra. And uh, my student, especially, this is Arushi Mishra, she did the work. Um, and I should thank uh, everybody. And I am open for questions. Yes. Well, uh, Professor Devashis, you have several questions. <laughs> yeah, we should have. I think you are uh, one microbiologist. I am presenting in front of a microbiologist and a protein care. Uh, no, well, uh, there are, well, on this, uh, while we'll meet, uh, possibly a lot no, of we, questions. We may we discuss. Uh, I don't know proper <laughs> mechanisms. It worked. I just, uh, I can tell yeah, like that. So, so <laughs> your, your experimental set of short that some uh, chitosan proper, that is the carboxymethylase chitosan. Carboxymethyl chitosan. It's a, uh, a modified polymer of chitin. Yes. And uh, that 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 is uh, working to combat the growth of the organisms, especially the gram positive and gram negative. And uh, the, it will be useful for people to know that the two uh, unveil uh, reveal the mechanisms how does it do yeah yeah i'm i'm by in the that same time, um, yeah so please please continue. and by the same time the compatibility the cytotoxicity and the immunological implications 
all those if it is being addressed in future would be useful for the for its benefit okay and now questions are there are a lot of questions have been asked to you that uh, uh, like dr sarvadi asks that instead of lipopolysaccharides how about trying to experiment with chitin or chitosan in order to find because your address is with the lps whereas in case of the gram positive one there is the lipoticoic acid and ticoic acid no i uh, if i can answer dr sabarish thanks for the question um i did not uh, really uh, use any of these uh, uh, polymers uh, uh, i mean lps i did not at all use i was just saying that uh, these zinc finger uh, like structures can potentially bind to lps uh, lps like polymers and uh, and and probably uh, the way this uh, uh, the 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 killing of or or reduction of the biofilm of uh, step uh, or is happening is probably the the complex is somehow breaking the lps there and this is we need to still prove that how much lps is staying stuck to this because this uh, this experiment can be very very tedious and complex because already the polymer what i am using it's a carbohydrate and if i take lps it would be a carbohydrate bond so there would be a lot of background i can design an experiment um but uh, as of yet i'm just uh, trying to prove uh, the other way around if it works in uh, animals and um, if i can put, prove it uh, to certain genetic level or or uh, transcription level of bacteria that if it is uh, not simply we are demonstrating that uh by uh, structurally or uh, uh, pictorially that yes there is less biofilm formation we also did a elma blue assay we didn't show that uh, but we want to show that whether biofilm forming genes are down regulated or not uh, we are uh, having a paper which is going to follow this one uh, it's ready uh, yes one, uh, excuse me yeah one more questions i could address hello yeah i'm i'm listening one more question yeah please one more question is there yeah. uh, from from dr anusha and that yeah, anusha. if your product works then it could be it could be supported with uh, the regular antibiotics also it's a suggestion um uh, yes because see uh, it 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 doesn't actively go out there and kill so what if some bacteria is uh, there which is bit of far away from the material uh, the bit the bacteria which can come close to the material can only be killed um to the contact that means contact killing that is a mechanism what uh, what we describe here and contact killing mechanism could be anything like uh, destabilization of the cell wall uh, making developing pores Uh, there are many mechanisms here uh, so yes uh, an antibiotic could be supply, supplemented normally with implant associated uh, 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 treatments uh, people used to give a uh, uh, you know some bio, use of soft biomaterial to load drug and release drug out there now what happens here is once the drug is exhausted the bio, biomaterial itself gives the bacteria as a good hub like we saw it in catheter it's a hub for bacteria hydration and biofilm formation now what we are thinking about with this bi uh, biomaterial is a sword and shield effect meaning sword is an antibiotic which would be loaded in here it will go out there and kill the bacteria and if the bacteria tries to lodge in if the antibiotic is no more effective still it will not be able to lodge in the biomaterial this is a basic idea we had um Well, yeah, I, I hope it is you. suggested. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Professor Mistra. Over to Jaram, Dr. Jaram. Okay. Uh, I think uh, it's time to wind up the session. Yes. I sir. thank the complete audience and the participants who are there. Uh, in fact, uh, without uh, the registrants, it's impossible to conduct uh, such a, a big uh, conference. Especially now, these online conferences are becoming more and more uh, important. and we are not wasting time right uh, we are not uh, you know it's like there is no need of any physical infrastructure for everyone to get connected so we stay connected through online and whatever that is needed the updates that is needed 
is definitely going online and reaching the participants worldwide. It's not restricted to one part of uh, the country or state, whatever it is, it's going throughout. And thank you very much for, uh, for the uh, participants. And also, again, I thank uh, both the speakers of the, of the session, session five, Dr. Karthik, as well as Dr. Devasheesh. And also I thank uh, Dr. Asit to be with me. Yeah, so, I, and also the, uh, the participants and the organizers. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, moderator, thank sir. You. <laughs> Good. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kartik, Kartik, sir. Thanks for joining us. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ashish, and also thank you very much, uh, Professor J. Raman. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for your time, uh, J. Raman, sir. Right. <laughs> in between, I have to leave for many calls also. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not a problem, sir. You were there. That was uh, that was a big relief. Thank uh, you. Sir, we can discuss about the complex later. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you are the protein like, engineer. In fact, it's a, transcri a transcription factor that you were talking about. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a transcription. Uh, you no, know, I wanted to ask about the... Is the session live? It's the audience or the yeah, it is live. We can okay. uh, talk later. Okay. Then. Now it's something like uh, you know uh, the competition between the uh, transcription factor and the carbohydrate complex that you're talking about. So how? Uh, so we can discuss that. That could stage. be a completely new work, sir. <laughs> right. It will lead right. a new portal for us. <laughs> right. We will discuss. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. So I think uh, uh, today it is the end of the session today, and uh, um, uh, tomorrow I request all the participants to join uh, uh, at uh, 6:30 a.m. so that we will be able to listen to Professor Brennan. He is a very uh, 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 interesting. Uh, he has interesting profile, and there is Dr. Sudeep Rao. Professor Brinan, he uh, is a real entrepreneur on, in bioinspired design. That means he just, uh, the most example we have listened since the morning, uh, he actually found the patent uh, on the shark skin, which can actually be translated to an anti-biofilm plastic sheet. And the pattern exactly, uh, doesn't exactly look like the shark skin. Shark skin's patterns are 100 micron away. He, he developed some pattern, which is, uh, 10 micron or uh, one or two micron away. And surprisingly, that particular pattern, especially that diamond shaped pattern, does not allow biofilm formation. No bacteria can lodge. If the pattern slightly changes, then again, bacteria, if, if it is uh, stripes, then their bacteria addition will be there. So it's a, uh, there are a lot of mechanistic uh, uh, thing we need to understand on that. But uh, it would be really interesting to listen to his lecture. We, uh, I hope we will all meet on 6.30 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, hope you all be there. Now we have 124. I want all 124 to be present there. Thank you very much, participants. Thank you very much, Chair and our speaker and moderator, sir. Thanks to our host and co-host, uh, Professor Suresh and Ronak. Uh, and thank you, Jitain, thank you. for holding this whole session since from the morning. He did not even went out for a peeing. <laughs> uh, thanks all. Thanks. Uh, thank that you, would be all you. for thank today. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.